All right, guys and girls, welcome to Bend to Fishing. Today, we're going to be talking about advanced lake trout jigging techniques. So if you haven't seen my basic video techniques or basic lake trout jigging techniques, um, we're right now in like late summer and like even early summer, this lake trout fishing gets really, really good, but you got to watch the water temp. So if you haven't seen that first video, I'll leave a link to that below. Go watch that first. And then the rest of this video will make a little bit more sense. So we're on a lake right now that doesn't have a bunch of large lake trout, but it does have a bunch of lake trout that are in that uh, 18 inch plus range. Let's talk about the first thing that I like to do. So a lot of these lake trout lakes are big lakes. So they have a lot of wind, they have a lot of weather. One thing I'll do is I'll check the wind and the weather report for the day before. I care about lightning and I care about wind over 10 miles an hour. So I have a 16 foot boat and I recently heard a good kind of uh, technique if, you're, if the wind is greater than the length of your boat, don't go out. Uh, or if it's gonna be like that at some point, maybe you can sneak out in the morning like I am and go out before that wind starts. So today we're supposed to have like 10 mile an hour when my boat's 16 feet. So that's a good thing first off. I like overcast day. So right now we got overcast day. It is September 6th or 7th or something like that. Uh, and our season closes here at the end of the month. So there's only a few days left of lake trout jigging. So those are the first couple things. Um, water temp, cooler the better, but you can't always get that. One of the next techniques is I'm gonna be showing you guys a, a screenshot view or a live view of my sonar kind of throughout the day. So this is the Garmin 93 SV with live scope. I know not everybody has live scope and I know not everybody has a, uh, I have a Minn Kota Tarova, um, which has spot lock on it. So that's holding me in position right, near, right now, no matter what the wind is. So right now we're looking at a ton of bait on the screen. So when I was basically gassing out here, I have my transducer kind of faced a little bit. I have it faced level when I'm kind of on just off plane. So I can see fish around me while I'm almost on full plane. And that allows me to see fish and stop right on them and kind of spun around. So I spun around in this spot if I could show it from that camera. Um, but what we're looking at below us is a gigantic school of smelt. So these are, are either this year's fry or last year's fry. They're really, really tiny. So what I'm fishing with, and I'll show you real quick, is my lure. So this is live scope. My lure is actually deterring smelt from going any further. So you can see the smelt, and I'm going to bump the gain up just so you guys can see that it's stopping that whole wall of smelt right there, which is absolutely crazy but if you want to go back to 2d that's what it's going to look like on 2d and i'm going to take a picture just because it's really cool so this lake has a ton of smelt in it now other lakes like champlain and sebago and there's one other lake in new hampshire that have owl wives or uh ale wives if you want to call them that which is part of the river herring family or the herring family now they get a lot bigger so what i'm using is a very tiny tiny bait this is a little SX shad and a seven millimeter tungsten jig, which is like basically 0.2 ounces. And the head of this is glow in the dark. So I'll we'll actually use a glow UV light that I use for fly tying. And I will glow that to make that shine brighter when I'm in deeper water. Right now I'm in pretty shallow water. And I think there's a couple lake trout below me. So I'm gonna stop talking for a second, but I'm gonna send that down. That jig and that bait particularly are available on my website, along with the baits that I use on Champlain and Sebago that match that owl wife pattern. I'll pull up a picture right now of an owl wife. Um, that's a, another big bait for a lot of the Great Lakes um, and some of the ones around where I live, basically in New England. And I have one chasing me right now. He's changing his mind. So that's what he looks like on 2D. So he's the big mark and I'm the small mark. So, one of the advanced techniques is right now I am on the bait. I am literally, if I was to throw a cast net down, um, it was fine enough to catch the mouth. I would catch, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000. I don't know how many down there. It's an insane amount. But we don't want to be right on top of the bait because what I have is artificial and what that down there is not artificial. So you want to be just off that bait. So I just stopped here just to show you guys. One of the things about smelt is they will push into coves lake trout will actually kind of corral them just as you would see like a sheepdog i grew up with sheepdogs um, a sheep kind of like pushing sheep into a pen lake trout want to do that so they have one option 
their, their favorite option is to push it into some sort of cove or some sort of point. And I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about with a, with a shirt here. Um, hopefully this makes sense to you guys. But I thought about this on the way up here. So they love, so lake trout are pretty lazy in the, in the grand scheme of fish. They want to push bait. They want to do the least amount of work um, as possible, spend the least amount of calories getting the most amount of calories. So what they want to do is corral that bait and push it up either towards the surface, especially during ice fishing season, um, when there's a ceiling when they can't get out of the water, or two, they want to push it either into a cove or really close to shore. So I've caught lake trout as shallow as six feet uh, during the winter time and probably as shallow as like 15 feet during the summertime because they'll just kind of go everywhere depending on water temp. Imagine this shirt as being an underwater um, kind of bowl if you want to call it that and smelt will kind of pile up here and lake trout will kind of like race up and pin them against this I don't know kind of inside turn basically. So that's what you want to look for on Navionics. And if you don't have maps like I do, what you can do is download the Navionics app, and I'll leave the link for that below. It's also called Boating US. Um, there's also one for Canada and stuff like that. And that's going to show you terrain underneath the water. I'm not sure what the terrain looks like here. Here is just a flat. It just happened to be where the bait was right today. So we want to look for those inside turns. We want to look for those inside turns in kind of the middle of the lake in some deeper water for where those lake trout are going to be because the lake has not switched yet. So let's talk about the thermocline a little bit. So you might be able to see it if there's been some wind in the last few days. Some lakes and some lakes will do that. So the thermocline is where the hot water is on top and the cold water is on bottom. So you'll actually see a split, especially in 2D, where it changes from 39 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And if you want to translate that into Celsius, you can. 39 degrees Fahrenheit and below is one temperature. Basically, it's, it's just cold all the way to the bottom. And above that is that, you know, above surface temp, basically 71 degrees, which it is right now, down to that 39. So it'll, it'll be like a hard line. And fish won't usually pass that because they like that cold water. And I'm saying that if you don't have any wind, the, the lake might not set up perfectly to see it on 2D. It'll still be there. It's just really hard to see sometimes. So let's make a move and let's go see if we can find some, uh, some actual lake trout. I have seen some here, but they haven't been really active. So let's move. And don't, another advanced technique. If you have fish that are underneath you and they're not biting, don't be scared to move. Just, just move. Mark that spot, obviously, if you can. Mark it with uh, your electronics or on the Navionics app, you can actually mark it. And you can pay like $21 a year to get the advance, which will help you uh, see more lines and then do some depth shading and stuff like that. And that would definitely be a lake trout. So we're marking going over to more and more smelt. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put that motor in drive and idle it. And so you can do it with 2D. So there's a ton of bait right now as well. We're just baits kind of be stacked up in this bay for some reason. And I still have my trolling motor down. So if I see fish, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it in neutral and then pop it in reverse and stop the boat, which you'll see me do here in a second. And what I'm doing is called basically sharpshooting. I'm looking for individual fish or schools of fish that I can target. And it's kind of like hunting for those people who do, do game hunting of some sort, right? You're looking for individual objects to drop down them. You know, this is my scope, basically. This is my live scope, as they call it. Uh, that would be a couple fish right there. Or a school of bait. We're gonna pop it in reverse. Create some turbulence here and see if we can find them again. So we're gonna keep bumping forward here. And we might need to get out a little bit deeper. Depends on where the fish are set up. And on my particular sonar, I like to have three screens. I like to know where I am, I like to see 2D, and I like to see live scope. So there's a fish right there. We're gonna pop it in reverse. So if you don't have a, a tiller steer like I do, um, what you can do is, you know, have basically use your normal boat, pop it in reverse. And if you don't have spot lock, what you can do is called back trolling. And basically that's instead of going forward with the boat or a trolling motor, you're going to be putting the, basically backing the boat up. And that slows the boat down tremendously. All right, guys, let me show you that backing down technique. So the trolling motor is up and I have wind blowing basically at my stern. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to use my graph here and I'm going to basically back troll. So they do make, uh, there's a couple companies out there, I don't own any, but they make splash guards because you will get water over the back of your boat. I do have a trolling plate that I could drop down that will slow me down in reverse. But all we're doing is we're looking for fish. So there's a bait ball right there. I'm not seeing any lake trout on them. But if I did, I would just pop it into neutral, give it a second. Actually, there might be a couple on them. And I can just keep back trolling. And that slows the boat down a tremendous amount because it's not meant to go backwards. And you won't have to like slam it into forward and reverse as fast when you're going slower. So even if you had just a, uh, a normal trolling motor, you could pop that on the side there and, and do that. But that's how you do it. And if you see a fish, you can just pop it into neutral for a second and pop it forward again. Just, oh, actually, I just saw one. There's two right there. So that's me going down, that's me, that's the fish. And there's the bait right there. So I don't know if you guys, you probably can't see this, so my line is scoped out of the back a little bit. That's how I know it's time to pop it in reverse and get my line vertical again. Vertical is the best. All right, and since I have all the tech, I'm not gonna do this for much longer. And uh, if I didn't say this before, I'm using a polymer knot for all of my, my tying. So he's chasing me. So that's him, that's me. And he just changed his mind. Don't know why. So some days they just are a little finicky, which hopefully is not today. So if you have, if you don't have live scope, which a lot of people don't, especially for lake trout rigging, because it's not, a, it's not super effective all the way in really deep water. What you wanna do is put yours on 2D imaging, which most people have. And right now I'm not reading anything below me. I'm not even reading my own jig. And the reason for that is my jig is actually out of my cone angle. So if you wanna look at the sonar is right below my camera, so it's right below me right off the back of my boat. That is shooting down in a upside down ice cream cone. So that's shooting down like this. So imagine this being circular. If my jig is not right below it, I won't see it. And as the closer it gets to the surface, I have more margin for error. If my jig is here and my cone is shooting just past it, I won't be able to see it. So the further down you are with your jig, the more you'll be able to see. Yeah, so I just changed my frequency to 200. The best advice I can give you is turn your gain up to where you can just see your jig because your jig should be always smaller than whatever you're fishing for. So you want to be able to see that jig just barely. And I like to really see it and I like to have as live information as possible. So as fast as my sonar can go. So if there's a jigging mode on it, like the hummingbird, turn that on. If there's a scroll speed on here, so like there is on here. So let's go to sonar setup, scroll speed. I want, say it says it's 10, I want that to be maxed out. I want that to be giving me the fastest information as possible because I wanna be able to learn what that fish is doing compared to my bait at all times. All right, so I'm not seeing any fish here. There's that one that I stopped on that didn't wanna play. So we're gonna reel up, pull off spot lock, and go somewhere else. Simple as that, just keep looking. One of the things you can do if it's super windy out is you can take a couple of five gallon buckets and tie them to your cleats and kind of drag them off the side of the boat. That's gonna act as a, uh, a reverse sail and kind of slow your boat down as much as possible because you wanna be, you want that line to be as vertical as it can be. You don't wanna scoped out as I call it, uh, because you won't feel the bite and especially if you have braided it'll start to kind of go slack and you won't be able to feel that bite as much as, as 
you want to. So I'm trying to find somewhere a little bit deeper. We're in 60 feet right now. I want to be in that, I want to fish for lake trout as shallow as possible. A lot more fun when they're shallow. And I'll talk about how they, they burp and stuff like that here in a minute. If I can catch one, I feel like I can. So there's the suspended fish. There's more bait, of course. Let's go out a little bit deeper out here. So there's an individual lake trout right there. Let's drop down on them. So we're just hopping off a ledge right here. Let me show you what I'm looking at on uh, 2D here. Or let me show you what I'm looking at on a map. So we're at 76 feet dropping down in that 100 foot flat there, 120 foot flat. That's kind of where we want to be. And um, as you can see over there, those are all lake trout. So let's go back to our 2D. And we're marking fish right now on 2D and not on the live. So that's always good. We got one right below us. So we're gonna drop down. One of the things I forgot to say is I get up really, really early to go lake trout fishing. I feel like the bite's better in the morning. And if you're using live scope, you wanna have that gain turned up just enough to you so you can see your jig. So we got fish suspended off of the edge there, which is good. And what I'm doing with the live scope is I'm live scope seeing basically a rectangular on the bottom. I'm kind of just spinning it around so I can see what's around me. And oftentimes if I can't see my jig on 2D, I will reel up after the boat stops spinning, um, especially after like moving into an area that has wind and the boat's kind of resituated itself. I will wait for the boat to completely swing and then drop down right below my sonar. It's the, really the best way to do it. So I can see two lake trout over here. Actually three lake trout over here, I think. Maybe even four. So we're gonna try to go that way with just the trolling motor. So they're right below us. Cause they might not see me. I'm in a hundred and something feet of water. They might not see me far, far away here. So we got run one right below us. What I'm gonna do is since it's a hundred and something feet down there, I'm gonna hit my jig that's glow in the dark with a UV light. And what that's gonna do is glow that super bright cause it's not really super bright out today. But we got a couple below us. See if I can drop down on the 2D side. So there is that lake trout on 2D and there it is on live scope. Not a big one, but there's my jig going down. You wanna see your jig pretty much going down the entire way. That's the best thing you can do. And just like any kind of schooling fish, the more you see the better because what's gonna happen is they're gonna do the, the seagulls from Finding Nemo, mine, 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 and they, they have to see that competition and they really don't wanna be left out. So and they're pretty much always hungry, they always eat. So there's me going down and there is me going down on live scope, that little tiny dot. And I'm fishing for those little stripes right there, those little hot spots. So I got one chasing me right now. Come on. Trying to matching his cadence and you can see that he dropped off right there. So that's me reeling up and that's him dropping down right now. But it was a single singular fish. But now we got me on top, one, two, three, four lake trout under my cone. So that's always good. Well, he didn't like that. Now what I'm doing is called the cat, the cat and mouse game, which can be super fun and super aggravating. If they're not biting, it's aggravating. If they are biting, it's super, super fun. So that one's not engaging with me, this top one right here, right there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop down past him. I have a pair of them coming in right next to me, which sometimes are usually bigger. Usually there's a pair of them that will come in be just slightly bigger than the others. And what I'm doing is I am not letting them see it fully. Ooh. So what I'm gonna do, since they're being finicky, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my bait Take a pair of scissors, or you can bite it off. 
does not taste very good. Tastes better than most baits. And I'm gonna downsize because I'm gonna show you a picture right now of my hand, of my hand with a very, very tiny, what's called pin smelt or pinnies as we call them, which is like this year's fry. I mean, they are tiny, tiny, like not even an inch long. So I just lost all those fish. They went right down, back down to the bottom. So they will chase up. So just how divers aren't allowed to, I mean, divers can go straight down, but the problem is, with, especially with diving tanks, is they get barotrauma. So they need to release those gases. Lake trout have the ability to burp, which, which, which makes them so fun. Actually, let me see if I can stick it to my hand. This is what I'm competing against right here. This is the bait that they're, this is the bait that they're on right now. And that's probably an inch and a half. That's a big one, man. So that's this year's smelt fry. I'm trying to match that tiny profile as much as possible. That's why I'm using such a small jig. 